got another set of questions for the alkenes in addition polymers topic and as always the link to the questions in the description of the video if you want to try them first. Okay so make a start so why has compound A got a low melting point in compound B? Well it's all to do with the fact that compound A is branched. So because A is branched it's got less surface contact between its molecules they can't get as close together basically and because of that it's got weaker induced dipole-dipole forces between the molecules, or you could say London forces there and obviously if they're weaker less energy is needed to break them. Moving on to part B where we've got a name compound C you'll notice I've numbered the carbons I've started with this one being number one because it's got the OH group bonded to it so it's going to be a hexan one all of some description because it's got six carbons and the OH group is on the first carbon but it's also got a double bond between three and four so that gives it this name hex 3n or you could say e now if you wanted to hex 3n one all now because functional group priority isn't tested at A level you don't have to give this name you could name it where the alkene part is the main priority has the main priority and therefore the OH group would be classed as a hydroxy group so in that case the name would be 1-hydroxy hex 3E. Next part is just a memory test for this definition for stereoisomers so we need to say they've got the same structural formula but different spatial arrangements of the atoms or groups. Moving on to the next part where we've got to give the cis and trans stereoisomer structures of compound C so I've started my answer off by drawing up the carbon-carbon double bond the cis isomer or cis and trans isomerism compares the relative positions of an identical atom or group of atoms across the double bond so on the carbon-carbon double bond we've got two hydrogens so in the cis orientation the hydrogens are on the same side of the double bond so we need them both up there or down there if you wanted and for the trans one you've got to go diagonally opposite so all we need to do now is put the rest of the atoms on moving on to part C now we've got to show how p orbitals are involved in the formation of a pi bond so on each of the carbons there's a p orbital so draw one there there's the other one there and what these do is they overlap sort of sideways and show it like that and that generates the pi bond so you get this region of space which has sort of roughly that shape above and below the plane of the carbon atoms there moving on to part B now suggest how the HBr molecule can act as an electrophile basically all we've got to do is weave the definition into our answer so an electrophile is an electron pair acceptor so something like that would be absolutely fine HBr can accept a pair of electrons if you want to be more specific it's actually the hydrogen of the HBr that can accept the pair of electrons because it's got that slight positive charge because of the higher electronegativity of the bromine and the next part compound D reacts with HBr to form a mixture of compounds E and F so we can see hopefully what I've done I've broken the double bond so of course I've got a single bond there and we can either add the H there and the Br there or the other way around moving on to the mechanism now so compound D react with HBr to form either E or F and we can show either uh, formation I'll do both just so everyone's covered so the first thing we need to do is put a dipole across the HBr bond slightly positive on that hydrogen slightly negative on the bromine due to the electronegativity difference a pair of electrons from the double bond is going to come out and be attracted to that slightly positive hydrogen and that's going to break the HBr bond by heterolytic fission. So in terms of the intermediate structures we get these here so starting with the left hand one I've obviously put the hydrogen on this carbon here so hydrogen on there which makes this carbon the positive one obviously the bromine becomes a Br- ion and all we need to do to finish this one off is put a curly arrow from the lone pair on the Br- to the C plus and likewise this one here would do that Moving on to the last part of the question now where we've got to decide which is the major product you'll notice I've written up secondary carbocation intermediate next to this and tertiary carbocation intermediate next to this 
So the intermediate, the carbocation intermediate that's formed in the mechanism can either be primary, secondary or tertiary. So this is a secondary one because the carbon with the positive charge is bonded to two carbon groups directly, whereas this one is bonded to three. So we need to know the relative stabilities of the carbocation intermediates and the tertiary is the most stable, secondary is the next most stable and primary is the least. So in the case of these two, this is going to be our major product because it forms from the more stable tertiary carbocation intermediate. So in terms of name, we've got 2-bromo-2-methylpentane. I'll just quickly explain that. So longest continuous carbon chain is five long. One, two, three, four, five. Carbon number two, we've got a bromine and a methyl. And B comes before M in the alphabet. So that's why we put them in that order. Moving on to part E, so we've got a couple of calculations to finish. So we've got to work out the volume of hydrogen gas needed at RTP for the reaction. And because we're told um, it reacts to produce a saturated alkane, we have just carbon-carbon bonds in our product, which, if, which means that the three double bonds all react with the hydrogen. So the first thing we need to do is work out the moles of micrine used in the reaction. So mass mole has to be in grams. So mass over MR, 0.0015 moles of the micrine. So the moles of hydrogen needed is going to be three times this because of those three double bonds. So that's 0.0045 moles of hydrogen and to turn it into a volume in centimetres cubed at RTP we need to multiply the moles by 24,000 which comes out at 108 centimetres cubed. And the last part of the question, quite tricky this I think, so where do we start? Well, we're told that we've got 0.02 moles of beta carotene reacting with 5.28 decimeters cubed of hydrogen gas. So the first thing we can do is work out how many moles of hydrogen gas that is. So that's 0.22 moles of hydrogen. So the mole ratio between the beta carotene and the hydrogen is going to be 1 to 11. So that means there's 11 carbon-carbon double bonds in the beta carotene. So moving on to the equation now. So you'll notice I've written up next to saturated that this has got two rings and a branch because the reaction with hydrogen is not going to change the fact that it's got the two rings and the branch chain. So if you imagine a saturated hydrocarbon that's got 40 carbon atoms and no rings, it's going to have the formula CnH2n plus 2. So it's going to be C40H82. So then if we factor in it's got two rings, we need to take off two hydrogens per ring. So we need to knock four out of this, which takes it to C40H78. The branch doesn't change the number of hydrogens. So only rings and double bonds do. So the product, this saturated hydrocarbon, must have the formula C40H78. We've established that beta carotene has 11 carbon-carbon double bonds, so it's going to react with 11 moles of hydrogen. So that means the molecular formula of the beta carotene must be C40H56.